Hi, everyone. This is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame, and bringing back the Zoom meetings with discussions in Kempo, related subjects to Kempo, the Law of the Fist. And then we have special guests that come on. And I'm really excited to have my good friend Todd Durgan. He is the founder of his system. He is an incredible talent. And the nice thing about talking with Todd is the intellectual side of our art gets to be explored. So today we're going to have a great conversation between Kempo principles and then ground fighting and how they can be related to one another. And so with no further ado, let's invite my good friend, Todd Durgan. How you doing, Todd? Welcome. How you doing, Paul? It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so yes, much sir. for uh, nice inviting me in to have this wonderful discussion on this very focused aspect of the arts. Yeah, you know, that's because that's one thing you do well. You, you, you can really zoom in on, no pun intended, <laughs> <laughs> zoom in on, on the issue at hand, and we can clear it up. So we're going to break it down a little bit. Uh, some background that's really important that I think we need to understand. I'm going to put my glasses on because I need to read, and that's the way it goes. Mr. Parker was one to always think about the uh, point of view. That was one of the great concepts that he came up with which was the point of view, Todd's view, my view, and a third person watching it. And thus, we can learn from that. And maybe our, we'll our responsibility. And it was based upon his collective thoughts that he had in his first book. We had a series of books, uh, you know, in the Infinite Insights, which I always like to reference to. I think it's very important as campusists and just generally martial artists, yep. uh, Todd, that you have some kind of reference. I know you've looked at these books and a lot of your research and the writings that you have are based on that. But Mr. Parker had something called the eight considerations. And I'll just read them real quick. Acceptance, obviously a mindset. You know, as Frank used to call it, you better be right in the head before you get in the ring. Otherwise, you're going to get your ass kicked. Right. That's what I'm saying. So understand bad things can happen to good people. It's like driving your car. Don't be on the cell phone. Don't be meddling with a, an argument. Clear your mind so you can react because it's going to come at you quickly. Second thing was environmental awareness. Obviously, if we're aware of where we're at, and you can explore and expand on these for me, we can avoid a lot of problems. Uh, there's a concept that was brought up by Dr. Chappelle, and we'll explore that a little bit, about you know attempted attacks and applied attacks, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. You're going to talk about that, because I'm going to let you explore that. Obviously, yeah. range speaks for itself, uh, you know, position, Maneuvers. People don't understand what the maneuvers. It's really footwork. Be able to position yourself in it. People fail to understand that our basics are the essence. The complete success or failure is on good footwork, good foundation, and understanding what to do there. Everybody's all worried about their hands, and they're getting their ass kicked because they're on their back because yeah. they're not following it. Obviously, targets they present themselves in the in the in the whole context of the fight. You'll learn to see that. You'll know how to respond with the proper weapon, which again comes natural weapons and natural defenses. So those are Parker thoughts. And uh, I think the other two that I have, uh, that I think that one thing that he spent a lot of time with Bruce Lee, and I always like to reference Bruce, uh, not because of um, his uh, television or movie, uh, fan, uh, you know, uh, acknowledgement, and 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 that's where he's really famous for. He brought them, mm -hmm. but these are some things that are fifty years ago, right? He's dead for fifty years, and yeah. it's just amazing how he looks at certain things. So one of the things that I like is a quote: "Is knowledge knowing in time? Knowledge surely is always of time, whereas knowing is not of time. Knowledge is from a source, from accumulation, from a conclusion, while knowing is a movement." I always like to say there is knowledge that is imparted by spending time with Master Durgan. The <laughs> thing that you need to learn as a martial artist is the wisdom on choice. That's the key. There's knowledge and there's the wisdom of how to use it or not use it. And that's right. very important. Those are things there. The other two people that I like, that I always like to do something, is uh, when it comes to Sun Tzu and the art of war, he says the difficulty of tactical maneuvering consists in turning the devious into the direct and the misfortune into gain. Now, all these quotes that I'm using are have a relate to what we're going to talk about tonight because I'm going to try to put aside our differences of things like, well, 
folks, you know, we have this problem. We always think this is better. One is better than the other. When you really don't know, you need to actually explore a little bit of that. I think that, um, you know, the key here, and, and this was in Miyamoto Musashi, he says here, the ancient masters must be studied constantly without respite, even when the practitioner thinks he has grasped the knowledge. In other words, just because it's old doesn't mean it's not effective. Right, Can't absolutely. So we've got a lot of stuff to go with there. So tonight, this is one of the great strengths of Todd's system. And he's going to explain that to you right now. We've done this in the past, but I always like to lay out a foundation first. And we're going to talk about why Kempo is Kempo. And generally, when we deal with most activities in our life, we deal them vertically. Occasionally go horizontal. So, Mr. Durgan, why don't you help us out to understand what we're talking about today? Give us our vertical versus horizontal responses. Funny. So let's start with a let's let's start with a very famous uh, uh, Ed Parker quote: "He who hesitates meditates in a horizontal position." Uh, so, so that should tell you right there that that's probably the position he never wanted to be in because one of his most famous quotes ends you in a horizontal position, <laughs> which is, you know, ultimately he's saying that's not the place you want to be. Um, and, you know, the majority of everything that we do, like you said, is vertical. Uh, very few things we do in life are horizontal, sleeping and some fun activities that we won't get into. Um, are Watch your TV. Yeah, well, there you go. Watch the TV. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, and it's and it's interesting because um, you know, let's look at let's look at karate, traditional karate versus uh, jujitsu, or ja whether it's Japanese, Brazilian doesn't matter. Although Japanese jujitsu spends less time on the ground than Brazilian jujitsu, um, the the idea that it has been misrepresented uh, through the last two decades, two and a half, three decades, that, you know, 90% of all fights go to the ground or conflicts go to the ground. That's an absolute misrepresentation and was taken from either uh, in part on accident or unintentionally, or intentionally, I don't know. Uh, explain, from that, explain that. What are you talking about? You, you mean, who's saying that? Is that a policeman quote? Is that a martial no, arts no, quote? No, so I'm going to get to that. I'm trying not to throw too many names out here. No, you can leave that part out. Sling the mud, you know. But uh, so some, we'll just say some uh, some uh, famous uh, jujitsu people threw out a quote that said 90% of all conflicts or fights go to the ground. So you need to study jujitsu. And is that because of the untrained? It goes to, because let's face it, Todd, when you look at, I'm going to, I'm challenging on this one. Okay. Sorry. It doesn't, doesn't matter what your challenge is because the facts are that that's an unfactual comment. Yeah, what that, that, that came answer, from. No, what I'm trying to say, let me interrupt you there. I'm saying that you're probably hearing that from the untrained. They're going, ah, most people don't know how to punch, know how to kick, but they, they seem to wrestle and, and, and. That quote, that, that quote came from on high in the jujitsu world. Okay. So let's face it. Well, that's an observation for him. For self dealing, so forget and they, that. exactly. Okay, and let's not take the, the personal, you know, preference there. But generally, if you watch a lot of fights, uh, a tendency to gets into a rolling on the ground or grabbing each other, and and actually, if you look at Parker's system in the web of knowledge, look at the first couple of techniques. What are they all category across? Yeah, the grabs and tackles. Exactly, pushes, pushes because that's ball. generally what we're dealing with first. Yes. Yeah. So continue. I'm sorry. But that's, but that's what we're but that's what we're dealing with as an attack. That doesn't mean that they're trying to take us to the ground. Understand that traditionally speaking, as if you're talking about two people going fisticuffs before the martial arts, before the uh, you know the ancient Chinese martial arts or Japanese or whatever you want to call it came into the U.S. Anyway, it was two people going fisticuffs. They try and grab a lapel and punch somebody in the head, or grab grab them and push them up against the wall. So it, it wasn't about throwing them on the ground. Now, you might have had some, one guy that wanted to wrestle with somebody else. Maybe they knew a little bit of catch wrestling or something like that. But it wasn't as elaborate as the jiu-jitsu of, of today or the uh, uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu, where they're trying to th take them down and put them in a triangle choke or, uh, you know, uh, catch them in a kimura or something like that. It was more of a boxing 
and it was more of an amateur boxing and the grabs and tackles uh, were simply a prelude or a prefix. It was a grab to a punch. And if you look at the, the self-defense techniques, that's exactly how they're set up. Lone kimono, delayed sword, um, triggered salute. Triggered salute's a push. It's an aggressive, uh, it's an aggressive means of trying to intimidate your opponent, right? So you have in that, and you know, you have the attempted and the applied. You have attempted pushes and you have applied pushes, okay? Some of those techniques can be interchangeable depending on your mentality and your understanding of how things work. Anyway, getting back to the ground stuff. So the ground, the ground game has been largely um, overrated with regard to how often a fight actually goes to the ground. Okay, it was done, it was, it was propagated so that they could increase business and make, and, 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 and it was spewed forth by many, many, many hundreds of people throughout the last two or three decades. Okay, it was a misrepresentation of an LAPD study that showed that police officers taking in, taking a, a criminal in and putting them in cuffs 90% of the time will take them to the ground to put the cuffs on them. And that's where that statistic came from. Why? Why what? Why because they're they trying to, to the because, because a police officer is not supposed to be punching, kicking, and knocking somebody out with their fist or their feet. They are supposed to be controlling the situation, de-escalating it, and and putting them into custody. Well, it's yeah, and and another thing is we had all these lawsuits brought against the city constantly for uh, over uh, police abuse. Mm -hmm. tactical arrests yeah you know, let's face it though i mean you know <laughs> i've been around police officers my family has law enforcement background and the last thing they want to do is get an altercation so they Absolutely. they bring they bring the equalizer out real quick mm -hmm. either a you know a stun gun which is more prevalent today uh right. some kind of mace or they use a baton now they were doing they use those but they got to be very careful because those right. three you know you know there's you're going to have a civil liability issue there. The other thing they used to do is when the ground tactics were being done and they're rolling around on the ground, this guy is in his uniform. He's in there on the asphalt and the, and the yep. glass and who else knows what else is all over the thing. And, uh, and then also you brought an element into the equation that is unknown. Yep. You and I, and most of us that are watching this, we train in in control environment first and foremost second what we do have supervision to make sure somebody doesn't go something doesn't go away because right. while you're training people do get hurt i mean i can't tell you you know you could be an improper arm bar or something could break something or what happens all the time in the it happens all the time in the classes when people are rolling i know i know many 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 jiu-jitsu practitioners who have been of uh, uh, permanently injured shoulders, elbows, all kinds of things. I mean, it happens enough in in a, in a traditional uh, karate or a kempo class, anyway, where you get a hyperextended elbow or a, a knee or a twisted ankle. I mean, it, it's bad, and we're vertical. Imagine going to the ground, and that's all you're doing is putting on arm bars and shoulder rips and triangle chokes and all these other things. I mean, that you know, you're it is you're statistically you're. Oh, and I, I, I'm not trying to dissuade anybody or to say that that is not a proper uh, study of martial arts. I am not doing that. I, I, Mr. Parker came from a judo background. However, mm -hmm. Parker's judo was a sport. Jiu-jitsu evolved from that. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely correct. So thus, it has become now more of a sport. Mm -hmm. And it's used in controlled uh, settings. Like you'll see, uh, you know, in... UFC or any MMA, uh, at some point it used to be all the grappling. And sure, but the problem is, is that we were also telling in the grappling um, settings, you couldn't hit these guys the way we would hit these guys. Right. Uh, it's a big difference between street and sport. And Huge I've had this discussion with the seniors before. Huge difference. Uh, one of my black belts was uh, when he was a green belt. He, he's from Hawaii and he's a he was a green belt he went back home one summer and while he was there some friends of his uh, 
invited him to come down and work out with them in the jiu-jitsu studio wherever over there in Hawaii. And uh, so he, he said, uh, he came back and uh, he said, I, I don't get it, Mr. Durgan. He, he said, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be rolling with these guys and I'd do this. And they'd say, oh, you, you can't do that. And he, he, he said, so I'd do this other thing. And he, they'd say, oh, you can't do that. And I said, well, what were you doing? He said, well, I'd get them in a finger lock or I'd have a wrist lock or I'd have a, you know, all these more small circle jiu uh, yeah, contact manipulation, uh, you know, smaller focused, more focused things. And uh, he said, yeah, that's all, all I heard the whole time I was there is you can't do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this because it is a, it is a sport study. And it is focused on, um, you know, it's focused on a controlled environment, controlled arena, and they're working toward um, a tap out or uh, uh, or points versus, um, you know, annihilation of your opponent, which is the main thrust or or most focus of the Kempo system. We can go three. There's three levels we're going to talk about. We did talk about vertical and then we're going to get into horizontal and we need to transition between the two you had the great um opportunity to train with one of the leading joint manipulation masters you know who i'm talking about oh yeah well yeah yeah exactly wally J. yeah well, did, I, he, did he I, spend I, much time on the ground he spent, no, <laughs> he, he spent zero time on the ground <laughs> i no. know yeah parker said the same thing so what i advocate and I think, um, you know, I think I said it with Lee, the knowledge of understanding your opponents, you don't have to be a master at ground attacks, but you do have to understand the basic principles and concepts and to engage a bit in it to understand right. what happens you're on the ground. You Absolutely. can use, we can use our Kempo training to get us off that ground quickly because that a person that we're dealing with, chances are, if he's just a street fighter, let's take him a street fighter. He knows how to grab. He's going to scratch. He's going to claw. He's going to try to hold one out. You get to a more sophisticated fighter, somebody that trains in ground fighting. He's going to go more for the locks. He's going to know how to choke you out. He's going to get body position. But for the most part, you're probably going to deal with somebody that doesn't know any of that. And you're going to the ground. But you can't presume that. No. So well, And so, go ahead. So my point is, is I was speaking with uh, one of our seniors and I'll get into him in a moment. And I asked him about the training about ground, you know, warfare. What do you do? I mean, I'm thinking, you know, Mr. Parker, we're talking late fifties, early sixties, the beginning mm -hmm. stages of, of Ed Parker's Kempo. Mm -hmm. And remember Parker came from the background of boxing, judo. He trained with Chow. As it was put to me, the number one thing is, uh, and I read that earlier about acceptance. You better be aware something's going to happen and be and looking at your environment. And if you don't, then attempted stuff is going to be nullified for the most part, or at least anticipated much greater than all of a sudden out of nowhere, Joe Blow jumped up and grabbed me and took me to the ground. Right. Well, how did that happen? Well, I was walking down the hallway, looking at my cell phone. And what happened? The guy jumped out. Well, what's the difference? You're on your cell phone texting and somebody pulls out in front of you, you hit him in a car accident. Same thing. You could have avoided yep. that by anticipating. But those are common sense analysis. So, well, let's get into it. Uh, they, uh, As it was put to me, that wasn't it. If you think you're going to have it, you get it on right then. You just preemptive strike. And you do the strike. Finger poke to the eye. Kick to the groin blow out his leg, whatever, you know, and then you take him down. Now, my guy that I was with for 40 years, he didn't spend any time on the ground unless we were drinking. <laughs> we were flat out, park walking catches, but we were on the mat. It was always, he ended his sentences. You gotta love it. His sentence was always a takedown, slam the bastard into the ground, face into the ground, or throw them over with a sweep, I take down, but, but when you start to disrupt your foundation, your stances, your foot maneuvers, you better be careful. Otherwise, it can backfire and the opponent you're working on, even if he's compliant and knows what you're going to do, if you improperly apply a technique, 
that person can fall on you, resulting in your own injury, self-infliction. You fall and you break your arm, you land, he hits your head, he falls on your leg, whatever. And, yep. and that's the key. So we're going to talk about that transition of vertical fighting to a horizontal, but if we don't need to go there, how do we go short of going there? And then if we are there, then what would you do? So we're on the premise, folks, that you have a bit of an understanding. If you're a yellow belt or higher, you should understand a lot of these concepts that we're talking about, these, these techniques. And by the way, they're called base, base ideas. The ideal phase is that you don't get your ass beat up, okay? That's, that's base, my thinking. These techniques. So, but, but let me touch on something first about the whole injury thing. So one of the things that we do, uh, people have a tendency to do, even in the vertical situation, you talked about injuring yourself if you're taking somebody down. People have a tendency to do this if they're, if they're not studying proper body mechanics and application of body mechanics as well, doing uh, executing techniques. Look at lone kimono, for example. Lone kimono is one of my favorite ones to point this out with because people have a tendency to just lift the arm straight up and down this way. And that's the worst way to do it because you'll, you'll tear your rotator cuff. And, and I, I've heard people say, oh yeah, but you're, but you're doing this other thing with that. And no, I, it doesn't matter what you're doing with that. If you're lifting that arm this way, that is a rotator cuff. You're going to blow your rotator cuff out. Um, How do you fix that then? Well, okay. So you need to cup that arm and you need to come, you need to use this in the direction that the muscles and the bones all work together. And so if you use this uppercut fat motion and then rotate up through it like an upward block, right, then it works beautifully. Now I know this and is factual because I had it confirmed by a couple of um, uh, physical therapists that were in a class one day. They actually came up to me afterwards and said, thank you very much for showing that because I, I made sure that I demonstrated this is what you don't want to do because you don't want to hurt yourself. And so we want to avoid personal injury. If we're trying to defend ourselves, the last thing we want to do is hurt ourselves in the process. Okay, so anyway, go ahead. All right, Mr. Parker, when he was, it's funny that you, ta you touched on that. He also explained that to me as thinking of it as an uppercut strike. Yep. Because it's all in alignment. It's all, it fits exactly, exactly what you need to do so that you can yeah. have that. You're creating, and, you're creating a brace. Yeah, a brace. And, here, and he he liked to also call it a form of bridging. You're yep. taking that strike instead of just, a lot of people think of the word block as just a solely a defensive maneuver when you think about a, a blockage you know you got it's stopping something it, it's it is but i think of what parker said and and also chuck sullivan is big on this we strike so i think of a, a block as a strike now well, take just, the, takes you back to his another quote that he has which was what if you touch them hurt them exactly <laughs> well if they're going to well you and i have we've had this conversation i have a little guy Somebody's going to try to hurt me. Uh, that means he's my son's going to be denied his dad for some right. point of time, be it weeks, months, maybe permanently, because I allowed something to happen. That's not going to happen. You, right. I don't take it as me. I'm talking about my family, right. and so. But this goes back to the proper instruction. So, if you're going to use mixed martial arts, okay, which is well, we do. We've 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 done that. We've combined concepts and principles and 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 whatnot. We have a heavy grappling in there. We but we don't go to the ground, you know. Right. For the part we have joint locks. I mean, I love your your definition of explaining, uh, you know, uh, delayed sword and how that actually can be implied in a different way rather than just a strike. Right. You know what I'm talking about in the yellow ball. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If any folks, if, by the way, if you get a chance to watch a uh, dot on that, you need to really, it really puts it in perspective. It gives you alternatives. If you're a law enforcement security, you would want to use that concept the way he teaches it so that it does the same. The end result is you have the your opponent in compliance where you don't severely injure them, but right. you can. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, people don't yeah. understand it. You know, using a concept called sequence rescripting. And, and that's exactly, you know, that's interesting in itself. There's a lot there in his books. So, um, but we need to talk about why is there a problem 
with the segue going between vertical to horizontal in? You know, I, I think that, I think part of it is that there's, um, there's, there seems to be in some people's mind this need to, to, you know, just blow this up and create this great, fantastic thing instead of, um, you know, looking at some, some things that are true and many quotes and speeches and over the years and centuries have been said about, you know, keeping things simplistic. And if you look at this, if you look simply at the Kempo system, it has opportunity throughout the entire system to integrate uh, throws, takedowns, all of those things. It already uses cho some chokes and strangulations uh, as either as the attacks or as, as a defense to the attacks. And if you study both sides of those in the system, then you get a, then you gain a greater uh, grasp and understanding of what those are. Um, you know, we have, uh, let, let's just take a, a simple technique like uh, the grip of death. So you have a really simple basic, basic technique where you're coming in and you're striking to the back of the leg to put them on one knee and then you're pulling that arm off and punching them in the back of the head. Well, that's a pretty simple takedown, but you didn't have to go down with them. It gave you an out, right? If they're choking you, if they have their hand around your neck, it gave you an out for that takedown. So you didn't have to go to the ground with them. So if they came, uh, you know, and there's there's some there's some really fancy chinna ways to get out where you come around behind and so on and so forth. But that basic technique gives you an out. Okay. And then you go forward into some of the other techniques and they're, they're kind of the same, but they also give you how to do the takedowns. They teach you how to do the takedowns. Now, the way I learned the system may be a little bit different and there might be a little bit more to it because uh, Mr. Rainey did some different things with the base techniques as I understood later. Um, where the majority of the base techniques that I got were kind of ultimately the technique and the extensions that are taught as extensions, right? Or some variant thereof that he put together. Uh, and then on my own journey, I started incorporating more and more takedowns. And the thing is, is that what I see a lot is I see a Kempo technique, a takedown, and then some jujitsu, which singularly those things are fine but when you try to put them together it's like putting uh oil and water together because you have to stop one and then move to the next instead of being able to for example if i go into a takedown let's say i'm doing a spinning reverse step through sweep out of uh, flashing mace i come through boom i spin i, I come back around and i take them down and as they're going or let's go back to, let's go to tripping arrow instead tripping arrow, I pop in, I come around with the leg and I go into the takedown. Well, as I'm going through that takedown, I'm hugging that arm, I'm gripping that tightly, okay? So that as they go down, the arm is being extended and locked in place. And all I have to do is pull one knee on both sides of their body, of their shoulder and collapse. And I can just sit down next to them and I have that arm bar. And I didn't have to do anything excessive. Or I can even stay on my feet and I have that arm bar. I didn't have to stop, switch gears, and go into something new. And this was, <clears throat> it's funny because it was, it was really brought to the forefront of my understanding or, or really made me aware of it, I should say. When I had a couple guys training with me, they wanted to do some, they wanted to do some MMA fighting. And they came in, they had some jujitsu. One of the guys had actually trained with Mr. Rainey years and years when he was a kid, years prior to that. They came in, they had been training jujitsu for a while. And so I was working with them on some boxing principles and some, some Kempo fight, fighting stuff, you know, awareness angles and all that stuff. And then, so they'd been doing it for a couple months. And I said, okay, so now we're going to reincorporate your, or reintegrate your jujitsu. Okay, because you guys want to do some MMA, we're, we need to understand the transition from one to the other and how to avoid one or the other. And so I had them, I had them uh, face off, start to fight. So they're fighting and they're going, they're going, they're going. And he, the guy stops, grabs him, throws him on the ground, freezes for a minute or not, not a minute, but a, you know, a brief second. 
and then goes into something else. I said, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. And I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I got to take him down so I can do some, uh, some jiu-jitsu, uh, you know, get to the, I got to get him to the ground so we can, so we can roll. And I'm like, if you put him on the ground without a plan or having anything done to him, you guys are equal again. Okay. If I hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. And then I just throw him on the ground and I try to figure out what to do next. I might as well have stayed up punching him because I had the upper hand. I was already winning. I was already ahead. Okay. But then I throw him on the ground and I had no idea. Instead of you hit him, hit him, hit him. And as you're moving through them to take him to the ground, you're trapping, grabbing, or locking something so that when they hit the ground, you have them locked. You have executed a plan, right? You've executed, you've gone into a position that you're in control, not throw down. Now, okay, let's see what we can do. I think I'm better than you on the ground. Yes, and that's you, you bring that up. I, can, I, I, think of, um, I think of two techniques and I think of them right out of uh, one of it. Remember squatting sacrifice? Yep, absolutely. It's a judo technique. It really Actually, is. you want to know the truth? Yeah, go ahead. It's funny because I've seen I've seen on forums where they say, "Oh, that 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 you could never pull that off on a jiu-jitsu guy." And then on YouTube, there is a video series yeah. of Horian and Hoist teaching squat the squatting sacrifice first two or three moves. Really? And I, I'm pretty sure last time I checked, those guys do Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Really? So, but if you get into it and you look at that and I, I, it's not in any of my forms that I can think of, but no. uh, but I, I can think of uh, the other one I'd like to think of that manipulation, which we never, most people forget to understand that in the in the attacks, you know, there is the concept of trapping and checking and nullifying. And Absolutely. Doing that. Instead of being on the ground doing it, we're standing upright. Good example, Falling Falcon. You chap and you take him down, it's break, break, and then you pull it up. And if yep. you're yanking up, you're lifting his neck out and you're snapping right. that's right. all control oh yeah that's a great technique for that if you but that's in contact manipulation because you're already in there as you go to the mr uh chappelle dr chappelle's you know sub level four and you think out of range in range penetration contact manipulation in the grappling tech uh form uh techniques or uh, grappling systems let's just call it system a lot of them they take and they manipulate the person and then they take them to the ground, okay? Or they're mm -hmm. on the ground, they try to manipulate in it. We have a tendency not only to, to manipulate, but we strike them at the same time. That's why when right. your student was working with a grappling uh, school, uh, you can't do that. Well, no, that's what you're supposed to do. I'm not here to play even and just break even, let you right. do it. Yeah. I'm not a pretzel. Yeah. You're not going to do that. You know how to do all that stuff. Well, Guess what? I'm going to shove my fingers in your eye or grab your groin and, or bite you or whatever I have to do. And so yep. when, for example, falling, uh, falling falcon, you grab and you drop that elbow, you're in there. Parker was big on that. That whole body, backup mass, rotation, torque, you know, destruction, you know, causing to have, a, you know, height, width, and depth, you know, disrupted. You got some, something going. There's your foundation. Then you're slamming to the ground. What are you doing? You're doing the break to the arm, both sides, if you can even Definitely. get that far. But right. everybody, probably somebody is proficient enough that works on, on the grass and knows how to keep that pin there and check it with the body. I mean, that elbow can only go one way. You know, yeah. it can go the other way. Yeah. If it does, you're going to see bloody screaming and, and all other mayhem going on. So I, uh, I like the idea that, that we have ways to deal with it. We would prefer to have the upper hand. Um, in military um, strategies, you'll see it that they try to get the upper uh, uh, vantage point. They want to be up on higher ground, looking high down ground, like yeah. they're shooting into a, a barrel of fish. Yep. Because if they're even, it doesn't give them that same perspective. Right. Point of view, taking me up so I can yep. see what I've got here. And, yep. and when you think about that, Todd, um, that's, you know, that's important. Now, I'll back up a little bit, uh, regress here a little bit. You talked about uh, he's punching and, and then I better grab him and take him down. 
It reminds me of watching uh, a Kung Fu movie. And all of a sudden, they're starting to fight with each other. And then all of a sudden, the guy pulls out the knife. And then the next guy pulls out the nunchucks. And the next guy got the sword. And yep. the, they got to show all of them because yeah. it's, it's entertainment. You know, it's like, hey, wait a second. I have these. Oh, right. you have that? And, and and the biggest funny one is if you watch Indiana Jones and Harrison Ford, he's fought, he's fighting in the uh, yep. in the, uh what the shopping area, you know, and they're all out there. And also the guy got the sword and he's swinging around. He goes, "I'll screw him." Pulls out the gun, bam, yeah, blows him away. Yeah. Correct. Originally, that was an improv. It can, I can see. Well, you know what though, it was real. It was because he was. Well, I mean, so when they were making the movie, he was supposed to actually fight the guy, but he was too tired that day or something. And he he was like, just as a joke, pulled out the gun and fired. Actually, yeah. I had a conversation with him at the Stuntman's Hall of Fame at Universal that year for the fiftieth, and he said when they shot that, he said I had a fever. I had I had a, I I was sick. Yeah, that's what it was. Ready, and I couldn't. I said, do we have to really do this? He goes, what do you want to do? Is how about if I just pull the gun out and shoot him? He goes, crap, that sounds good to me. And I think the guy who was the stuntman was named was Kelly. Oh. Big guy, like six, seven, yeah. six, eight, dude. Huge. It was like, you know, this is, I've got it, man. I'm gonna do, and he's doing all the yeah, you know, it's like it's sort of like when you watch Enter the Dragon and yeah. you see Bruce, all of a sudden he's looking, he comes out and he takes away their sticks, and the guy's looking and goes, ah, and he, and he stops and he's beating them and he's doing his thing that was because it was a nice sales job oh, yeah. showing him doing weapon truth yep. okay which had never been done yeah so you know you look at this stuff and and it's interesting the question is is i think you need to have experience it's like a handgun let's let's put it in perspective folks you don't i, I i've never had a handgun i'm gonna take that from so I, I got this it's a handgun here okay and I've never had one before, and I'm scared of it because why? All you know, the boogeyman right. stories, right? You know, I, oh my God, people die. That, yep. That's going to kill me. Yep. No, it's not going to do a thing unless you pull the trigger, stupid, right? And do something dumb. All right. So don't fear it. It's nothing different. You actually get more likely to get killed by a knife in your <clears throat> kitchen, <laughs> right? So, so, and and to that point, uh, when I was putting together the face of combatives. I pulled in uh, some basic uh, judo throws. Some, so we have transitions into, and it progresses though. It progresses into the position to do the throw. So we're learning to acquire the position and then we progress into the throw. And we have some, you know, there's, there's four or five or six basic, very basic judo throws. I'm not teaching judo. I'm not a judo black belt. I want them to have a good understanding because that throw is something that they're going to use in jiu-jitsu, judo, and some basic, you know, street brawling fighting. So you get a basic understanding of not just how the throw works, but how to fall and how to recover from that, right? And how to transition, how to recognize the position that I'm in as being something that I can maneuver into that, or I'm already there and I can execute that maneuver. I can execute that technique. I can go through that throw. And so it's, it's important. And then, and then we do the same thing with some chinaw techniques, do the same thing with some uh, jiu-jitsu techniques where I have, you know, a follow-up secondary attack is a tackle, a takedown, an attempted, all of those things, you know, as we progress through the system so that we can be, so we, that we can, <clears throat> it takes me back to, it takes you back to that Jimi Hendrix song. So are you experienced? So you get, now you're not going to get the experience of rolling with Hicks and or Horry and Gracie, but you're going to get the experience, you're going to get enough experience and pressure to have to follow through and, and utilize what little understanding you have and are, are combined with your tempo striking and targeting. That's the idea. Well, we do cover, by the way, we do cover some judo you know, obviously, uh, tax, you know, anything that's right. escape from behind, somebody pushes you, fall forward, you learn to yep. roll, you yep. pop up. Some of those uh, techniques, I mean, they're just basic, what I call basic, um, you know, responses. And here's the thing. Well, Mace of Aggression is a, Mace of Aggression is a judo attack. If you look at Mace, the two-hand lapel right. grab, uh -huh. 
it if you they go to on the pell grab and they slide under it's a it's not ashigari it's something else but anyway they go and they slide under and it's a and it's a throw yeah that's exactly what, that's moving it's into a throw. Old, yeah exactly so but i'm talking about it in the falls yeah, yeah. Talking about yeah. Falls. so let's back it up you know we you talked about extensions uh when i grew up in pasadena i was uh i was old school so it's hard for me to decide or differentiate when they start breaking up from 32 to 24 to 16 to 12 yeah. and no more techniques do the extensions yeah, you, you know i mean i was just taught how to do the whole damn thing right okay and really the extensions were nothing more than just the original techniques broke it up into two pieces yeah. yep. three pieces, yeah. which is a yeah. very that's very common in the tracy system part mm -hmm. one part two part yeah. three part a four. and b yeah 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 kind of yeah business. And I, it's like, I don't want to think about that. I want to think, how do I get to the end? And Parker's idea, which we, you know, remember, basic folks, we're not saying don't train. No. On no, no. We're not at all. We're not saying. That. And we're not saying just eliminate some of your campo to go right there. No, no, no. I'll, I'm putting this together for you now. Okay. So you get five swords. And, you know, you get the initial bah, 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 right? And then you have the lift strike and then everything else they add to it, okay? Or a good one, again, example would be dance of death. You know, bam, 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 bam. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. And then break from over and then come over, pump. And, and Danny Inosano, by the way, great guy. I'm so excited I, that uh, Chuck Sullivan introduced my son and me to uh, to Danny and his uh, his studio. Yeah, one of these days I'll get a seminar with that guy. One of these days. You'll get to meet him next year because there's a good chance he's going to come out for the event, which will be nice for the I whole, still, I still the Campbell Body Hall. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a really nice, he's a genuine human being. He's so the only he guy does, I don't want to get in class with that I yeah, haven't gotten to get in class with. He did, uh, he did uh, Dance of Death in uh, the Game of Death. He did that yes. technique. Yep. And so for those of you that are not following, we'll say. So the point is, is that that was Corey. If you think about it, I like to think of the extensions as uh, a choreographed short forms. They are mm -hmm. it's like an extension. You're going to hit the guy. If you get in two or three shots, great. If you can get all of them in and then some, okay, that tells me some, something didn't all finish up. Because generally that first shot or two is going to – set the tone and and what's going to happen to this guy if you do it yeah. right. But right. there's always the what if, which is what we talk about. Parker used to call that the equation for me, where you would just rearrange and all of a sudden this came in and you had to modify it. So you take some other technique and you start taking this piece here and you put it there. And that's where when you get into the eight considerations, the targets that present themselves will result with you giving the right weapon to use because mm -hmm. that's where you're at. It's like boxers. You see them and they'll practice, Frank would teach, jab, cross, and a hook. Well, what if he said jab, cross, a hook, and then a right cross? Or faint. He would fake the, the jab. He wouldn't even send it all the way out. He would just send it out there just to make the guy could get the timing, a little distance, and then faint him, and then, bam, and then he'd come over with something. And that's the point we're making here. If you're going to go to the ground, the transition that we're talking about, it should flow. It should be a natural flow. Yeah. So hypothetically, you have, you know, mace of aggression. You get, you get this guy and you hit him. Well, then you might be able to take the buckle and take him down. When I grew up in Pasadena, it was sweep the leg. Everything was a sweep. Frank, yeah. in every sentence of pain i call them the sentences of pain okay remember the old story he goes you take the letters you put the letters together and you write a word you take the words you put yep. it together you get a sentence you take a lot of sentences you got a paragraph you got a lot of story i say you got a lot of pain well frank would always end every one of his techniques if he had to with a, a destructive takedown and right. he didn't let you he didn't just throw you to the ground he went down and that big right fist would come over the top or he dropped down with an elbow or a stomp. Yeah, that's a common that's a common trait of the time because that's exactly what Mr. Rainey does most of the time. And I got to be honest with you, it's a very effective. So we're going back to the to the concepts that we were talking about when we looked at Sun Tzu, we looked at Miyamoto. The, I mean, this stuff works, folks. So we're not saying don't for don't ignore it, but don't get caught up 
in the flavor of the month right now because you get to watch uh, entertainment and it's, you know, these guys are going there, but they have rules. They have yeah. somebody to break it up. Yeah. They're not, they're playing on a soft field. There ain't well, three or four other dudes jumping in to bite your head off. And like we were talking about earlier, even in the, even in the UFC nowadays, you don't see them going to the ground like they used to. Initially, when the UFC came out and I was watching the first one or two or three, um, you know, it was going to the ground because the other guys didn't know what to do. And then when everybody started getting a ground game, it started going to the ground less. Or actually, for a while there, that was the big fad. Everybody went to the ground and it was all a big thing. And then as time progressed over the last 10, probably 10 or 15 years, it's been less and less and less groundwork and more and more avoidance of the ground. And let's just beat the hell out of each other. Kick some punches. I, I, I've liked, there's a few guys that have gone over and, and not spent as much time on ground uh, responses, ground attacks and responses and whatnot. But they've, they've focused more on different ways to strike. And yeah. I've really been impressed with the guys that do Muay Thai, that throw at those knees. And, uh, oh, yeah. well, look, look at Chuck Liddell. Look at, look at Chuck Liddell. He was a very successful fighter. He hardly ever went to the ground. Because you know why? He knew that wasn't his strength. Right. Parker told me once, uh, and he goes, just because you know it doesn't mean you have to show it. Right. And sometimes showing it can result in bad decisions for yourself yep. um, you know i mean it can make you look not good or could injure you for your failure to execute it properly yep. remember you can win a fight uh, sun Tzu says if you can avoid the fight you won the fight i um i was with parker one time in, in the office and he was talking and he said you know paul you don't have to fight them today you come back the next day and kick his ass because <laughs> you psyched him out. He thinks you were quit, you know? I said, yeah. yeah, you're pretty right on that, Mr. Parker. Eh, you'll learn. <laughs> you'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. God Almighty, yeah. I, you know, these these things we share with our viewers here, it's, it's for our benefit to help share what we were shown by those that, that taught us. And I'm telling you right now, a cup of coffee is still a cup of coffee. I don't care what the label says on it. It's your choice of how you like it. Some people right. want to add all the fillers and sugars and all that crap. Do you need it? Well, that's up to you. But the essence of it, what was it you were drinking? Black coffee, which is yeah. really water that's colored by beans. Well, when some guy tries to grab you, you kick his ass. And you do it as direct and as straightforward as Mr. Durgan has taught you. Or you listen to some of the words that we've been sharing here. If you go to the ground, you better figure out an exit strategy. I remember well, Parker telling me that. He says, look for your exit strategy first before you engage. Because it may be you have to go right through the guy. Right. That's the only way out. Yeah. And he's so, right. so another thing, and I got to point this out because I see it and it's killing me. Uh, one of the most important things before you decide to practice on the ground or whatever Everybody needs to work on their basics. Stances, punches, kicks, all those things. If you practice those, they're going to save you more, more effectively than all of the other BS. As long as you're working them properly. So what is proper? Yeah, the essence, the secret, I, I shared this story way back when, and I showed this to uh, uh, Grandmaster Sullivan. You know, he's a wonderful guy. I had a conversation with him earlier, and I'm going to share that story with you in a minute. He said one time, uh, I told him the story that I was in Pasadena teaching a class and Parker came in, he got on the phone. I'll make it brief. And um, he's watching this, this, the, the, the class I was teaching. It was brown belts, I think, at the time. <clears throat> he watched and he came out and says, ah, Mr. Casey, I want to take over your class. I said, sure, Mr. Parker. Step back, everybody line up, pull your belts over, you know. You know, founding grandmaster here wants to talk. He goes, I'm going to teach you tonight the secrets of Kempo Karate. The secrets of, I'm going, oh my God, I told you the story. For you that have not heard the story, it's simple. It was the basics, the basics, the basics. Foundation, stances, foot maneuvers, your blocks, your punches, your kicks, execution. Those are those going to say, and if you can't do that right, you better be in damn good condition to outrun the son of a bitch 
Because I'm telling you, if a fox is chasing after the rabbit, the rabbit usually gets away because he's running for his life. Yep. The fox is just running for his dinner. Yep. And if yep. you ever look at uh, animals in the wild, they're not obese like, like <laughs> us. We have a tendency to walk down and grab some, you know, uh, Twinkies or chocolate donuts or Cokes yeah. and whatever. And not realizing that we're doing ourselves a disservice because that when we need it will happen. I bet you can tell a story about it's when you least expect it, Todd. That's when the shit's going to hit the fan. Oh, and yeah. You're driving. I've had conversations with Todd in the morning. He's very colorful. And um, <laughs> and and all of a sudden, he's talking. He's in a pleasant mood. Tells him, and all of a sudden, oh, that, why'd you do it? You know. Somebody pulled out in front of him or I have a sign. I have a sign. I have a sign on my car or something that says, please pull out in front of me or cut me off. Well, yeah, just make my day. I don't know what it is, but um, they do. They do that all the time. You talk about take the sign down. My wife says, my wife says it's my karma. I don't know what that means, but Uh, it's just you're just a pleasant man. What can I say? One of the nicest guys in the world, really. He's not. Yeah. He's not all that so, bad. So, uh, you know, along with that, uh, the groundwork and that stuff, you know, and part of the basics, part of those basics is understanding, uh, you know, the nine planes, proper proper methods and angles of execution. And if you're going to work, if you're working on joint locks and manipulations, chokes and strangulations, then part of the basics of those aspects of the art is levers and leverage. So you, you, you will only be a better martial artist and a better executioner if you better understand those. If you understand what a first, second, and third class lever are, you understand what an inclined plane is, what a, what a, uh, uh, that a wedge is two inclined plane. Thrusting wedge employs a double inclined plane anyway. Point is, those are other aspects of basics. It's basic understanding and knowledge. And uh, you touched on that with the whole knowledge and knowing thing earlier in the in the uh, session here. So I just I wanted to. By the way, if you get a chance, uh, try to contact Todd about his writings. He's in. What book are you in now? Number two or three? Um, I'm working on number two. Okay, he has a, a wonderful treatise uh, on on these concepts and whatnot. But they're based loose. Well, he has expanded on it in more depth and really fleshed it out. But if you go to Mr. Parker's Infinite Insights and you look at volumes four and five, you'll find the general premise there. It'll lay it out. It's not as in-depth as what Todd does. And that's important. Parker never got a chance to complete that before he passed away 32 years ago. So the point we're saying here is that, um, you know, the secrets have always been understanding your basics. And thus, you can have foundation. If you don't have foundation, you cannot stand. And it's still saying your house is built on a solid plane. It has to be. There's reinforcement, the concrete, the wood or uh, steel structure that's used there to keep it erect. It's all just basic uh, principles of uh, that you can talk about that are it, it exist. And if you can't understand that, then you need to go back then. If you don't know that, then you should ask your instructor to explain it to you and, and if you, he and doesn't you can accelerate your and you can accelerate your learning and your physical capabilities and and abilities if you incorporate the understanding and greater understanding of the things that you're doing i, I liken it to this back in the day when you went and trained with a master to learn karate he would put you in a horse stance in the corner for six or eight months and until you learned what a horse stance was might not have said anything, might have come over and whacked you with a shinai or whacked you with a club or whacked you with his hand or slapped you or something. And, and you just, through trial and error and a lot of hard work, standing there in a horse stance, doesn't sound like hard work, but I challenge anybody to stand in a horse stance, a good horse stance for an hour. Anyway, whereas nowadays... I know in my class anyway, if you come into my class and I put you in a horse stance, I'm going to explain the foundation, the uh, the physical makeup of a horse stance and what its purpose is, right? 
And then I'm going to explain how a neutral bow is related to a horse stance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, that begins this kind of uh, ex accelerated elevation of understanding and ability and ability. Now, there's no substitute for hard work. That's not what I'm saying. You must put in the work. You must put in the practice. You must put in the time. But in that same six months, if you understood what the horse stance consists of, what its physical makeup is, and what it's used for, you would be able to more uh, quickly execute it properly and understand it. Uh, you know, you're talking about... Um these things that we we go over and and i i sit there and spend a lot of time actually i turn a drill into for my students one of them i've been working on a lot lately is uh closed kneel and wide kneel mm -hmm. from a neutral bow mm -hmm. but what i do is i make you hold that slowly in a count of 10 mm -hmm. down Okay, then I sit there and talk to you and then I give you a count of 10 and then I make you go 10 back up. So for about 30 to 50 seconds, you're doing this, holding yep. it down there and then slowly come back up and do that two or three times. And I promise you, your legs are going to throb. They're going to burn. And yeah. the reason why, for the most part, we're lazy. Yep. I mean, you know, you get people go to the gym, yeah, and, and whatnot. And uh, the only lifting they do is the bottle and the food. This is it. This is their biceps are massive and their bellies to match. <laughs> <laughs> For example, I taught a, I taught a women's self-defense class, uh, only it ended up being a women's self-defense class because it was just women that showed up, but I um, uh, taught a workshop here two weeks ago. And one of the things that I showed them was that after you're done uh, poking, biting, scratching, kicking somebody that's on top of you, uh, basically showed them a, just a real simple version of a shrimp you know, how to shrimp away from the opponent, get up and get away. Explain the word shrimp for those that do not know that word. Well, it's a, it's basic. That, that's one of the basic uh, jiu-jitsu maneuvers that they use where it basically you're collapsing, you're collapsing and pushing away. You're, you're, uh, how would you explain it? Um, it's more like doing, it's more like doing a sit up. It's more like if you were sit, laying on your back and you did a, uh, a free, what would that be a, a, a sit up where you're with a leg raise in your butt, not your hands and your feet? That's the way I can describe it. It's you can pick a video on trimping if you need to see what it is for the listeners and watchers. Viewers. I think we should. One thing is that is remember the, the, the brilliance of Ed Parker was in the thinking. He wanted us to be thinkers. Mm -hmm. So he never discarded. There's the old story. Bruce Lee and him both were talking and they had a uh, slab of concrete in front of them, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Bruce would say, I'll just chip away and take what I need and discard the rest. And that's right. a system of simplicity based on JKD. Now, remember, mm -hmm. JKD is a personal philosophy. It is not a, uh, like a structured system like Taekwondo or Shotokan. And sometimes even Parker, Ed Parker's Kempo can have structure to it. But Parker gave you the outs gave you an escape clauses the the yep. what ifs instead of one punch one punch one kill you know uh, one kick one kill you know they're not thinking what happens if somebody counters that new and nullifies what you're doing so the point is is that parker says i'll chip away use what is useful but save it the other in case i need that someday it may be one time i always liked it when he used the the analogy of uh uh, of a toolbox and the Kempo toolbox has many tools in it. You place tools in there, you may never use one of them, but you have at least the confidence to know that there is a tool in there that when right. called upon, if you properly train and have your knowledge and experience in it, you'll be able to pull that out. And it's not a movie to pull out noon chuckas or grab some sticks and then follow. I mean, we're talking about things that that go back to the eight considerations and you look at natural weapons and natural defenses. Right. There's a great example of it. So I think that the key here is to understand what Todd has been talking about, still training, learning some of the, uh, the attacks and the responses. And, you know, it's like somebody's helping you uh, with the, you know, with a problem. You go, what's one plus one? Well, I don't know. I've never dealt with one plus one, but I right. learned. 
And then it, that's then, important. But you don't want to say I'm doing vertical and then I got to go to the ground right now because I have to do that. No, why don't we do something where you get attacked like charging RAM, which is a technique that's not in somebody else's system. They don't think there's any interest. Well, I don't think you understand what that's about because if you did, you probably would change your mind. But there's yeah. a grappling and you have a takedown. What do you do? You're on top of him now. Now you need to know how to manipulate that opponent so that you have the upper hand or the game. Like I quoted from um, Miyamoto when he says about the advance, the, uh, the advantage of taking simplicity to that was uh, you know, that could be detrimental to you, but is now to your game. And yeah. that's the key. That's In other words, you counter it like chess. You you counter this guy out so that you already know what your your options are. You're not thinking about it. like Parker used to use the pool table and how you set up your shots, either yep. to be offensive or sometimes defensive to prevent him from scoring because yep. you knew, you know. Um. Yeah, and that technique in particular is also an opportunity, and this is something I think people miss sometimes. It's also an opportunity to understand and recognize targeting, uh, more specific and pinpoint targeting. For example, the scapula. If you strike with an elbow strike to the center of the scapula, that shoulder and that arm is rendered ineffective. Absolutely. And, and it's funny because I've, I've had some people that – grapple tell me well yeah but you're never going to get that off on a on a real on a good grappler and um I, I don't know how good the grapplers are but i've had a couple guys come in on me that were uh, brown and black belt in judo and or jiu-jitsu and it didn't really matter much um because if i recognize now i'm not saying i'm all that for jiu-jitsu i'm just saying if i recognize the attack and i recognize the position and i understand the under, and I understand the goal of that person, right, or the intent of that person, then I have the upper hand. Because just like this, this kid was a, he was a judo brown belt. He was getting ready for his black belt. And he came into my class. He wanted to get a little bit of uh, hand, hand work experience. And we were, doing, we were doing a drill called checking hands. It's, it's kind of like uh, Frank's sticky hands. Right. And he, he kept dropping like he wanted to shoot in on me. And I said, I, and this was a number many, many years ago. And I said, I said, uh, Jose, go ahead. If you, if you feel like you got something, go for it. And he's, Oh, I, I don't want to be disrespectful. I said, no, nope, no disrespect. Go for it. So he shot in to uh, tackle me. And I, by the time we hit the ground, I had a cross leg choke, a scissor choke and an arm bar. And he tapped out and he got back up and he said, I, I, well, I, yeah, I thought you were just a striker. And I said, I never said I wasn't just, I never said I was just a striker. I said, you assumed that, which takes you back to that whole uh, uh, hesitation, meditation, horizontal position and assumption. Uh, anyway, I never saw him again. He never came back to my class, but it, it didn't. Uh, you know, the point that we're sharing here is that the thinking man will understand to identify, first of all, they'll identify the issue. They'll base their, their responses on the options that they have presented to them. If he's far enough away from me, and like for example, environment and range, it doesn't matter. He can, right. I, can I got time to respond. Parker used to always say time and distance, distance and time yeah. give you a better opportunity. The more you have to prepare for something, the greater chance for success. Absolutely. He who fails to plan, plans to fail is yeah. an old Ben Franklin statement. Well, and, and what he didn't understand is that he had given me his attack already because he had done his little, his little bob, head bobble a couple sure. times and I could see exactly what he wanted to do. And so, and we were at a close enough range that once he committed, he was hundred percent committed to that. And I knew that. So I, I immediately, I had the upper hand because I knew what he wanted to do. And I had the, I had the, the advantage of time over him because his world is, uh, you know, on the ground and there, there, things are a little bit slower. Okay. And so it took much more time for him to get in on me to go to the tackle than it did for me to process what was happening because we're at a very close range already, toe to toe, uh, you know, and in tight. 
all close range stuff. So anyway, it was fun. Let's, let's wrap up. We've been at this for some time now. And, um, you know, this is just scratching. Like I said, I always suggest that in the beginning, I always reference publications that have been around for some time. Some that's been oh, yeah. 2,500 years, some for about 1,000 years, some for only about 50, 60 years. But knowledge and wisdom can help you identify and further your abilities as a martial arts. Remember, we're not going to be 22 for the rest of our life unless you drop dead at 22. That's it. As you age, your resources that you have have to be more about wisdom of choices because you do have the knowledge. But abilities may be limited through other things that are beyond our control, just the way it is. So I think the most important thing we should take away from it is not to exclude any of what we've talked about. We're not attacking anything. We're trying to reinforce in your mindset, folks, that if you're a Kempelist or you're of somebody of the law of the fist, okay, and let's face it, you knock him out in, with that punch, and I promise you, or a finger strike or a kick to the groin or whatever it is, you're going to be ahead of the other person if you train that right. But if you're confronted with situation and it doesn't fall in the right proper order of the base technique, then the ideal situation at the very end is to walk away. You better adapt to it. And that's where Parker's thinking of restructuring, repurposing something that you need to do. Their equation formula is one example that I love. I think it's one of the greatest, greatest concepts he came up with, as well as point of view. Understand yep. what you've got going here and looking at your options. So, Practice and solidify your basics. That is that's something that I think Mr. Durgan would agree with me on. I know Absolutely. Ed Parker said that to me, and so has others. Um, when I talked to Chuck Sullivan, I asked him about this. We haven't talked about it, but I'm bringing it up now. I said, Chuck, when you first started in 1959 through the early 60s, did you guys work on ground attacks and segues in? And his answer was simple, no. That was it. No, we looked, We worried about hitting the guy, pre preemptive yep. strike, kick his ass. It, he used another word Frank used to call with profanity. And it was the truth. You're going to get on and get it on. Now, somebody grabs you. We had techniques for that. But there, everything was direct, was to the point. And we made sure we won this fight. It was slant in our favor. So just train a little bit more. Now we've gotten more sophisticated in 60 years. So maybe it's time to look at what Mr. Durgens is advocating. You, you know, the planes and levers and the fulcrums and think about that, read up on it. But before you go to him, pick up Mr. Parker's writings first so you got a little of an introduction. So you, otherwise you're gonna walk in, unless you're talking to him directly, to Mr. Durgan that is, you're gonna be lost. You're gonna say, this is way above my head. It won't be. Do the foundation. Learn to hold the horse stance for an hour. Okay? Got it? And then you can talk to him about this because then you have some foundation. So uh, what are your final thoughts, Todd, before we close out? Yeah, well, I, I do want to I do want to reinforce what you had said, and that is that I'm not I'm not trying to tell anybody don't do this or don't do that. All I'm all my point this whole thing through this whole thing is one, understand and practice your basics. Regardless of whether it's on the whether it's vertical or horizontal, they both have basics. And if your basics aren't strong, everything else is going to suck. Two, try to understand how to bridge that vertical horizontal uh, change, that transition, how that works. Right? It works differently for everybody, but it should never, ever, 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 never be a Kempo technique stop, change gears, and then a Jiu Jitsu technique. It should flow one to the other, and it should be almost unrecognizable, the difference from one to the next. It looks at fluidity is what you're basically saying. Well, the, the fluidity, but, the, but I mean, you can be fluid and be doing nothing in between the Kempo technique and the Jiu-Jitsu technique, right? Well, I don't think so, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, you, have you might to, have a hiccup there. Is that what you mean? It's a, it's, a con, it's a continuity. I'll give you the fluidity. It's a continuity between vertical and horizontal. Okay, there, has to be, there has to be, the transition has to have continuity. 
Sure. It can't be a start and stop transition. It can't be a stop start transition. You well, don't you don't get on a train. You don't get on a train. Get halfway to your destination. Stop the train. Restart the train and get going to your to the next half of your destination. Absolutely. We have a lot of that. Actually, we have the transition if you follow the flow of the techniques. So some of the ones we talked about today. Mm -hmm. There is the transition. Now he's on the ground. The question is, if you go to the ground with him or somehow you end on the ground with him, are you ready to not go, oh, my God, I'm in trouble? Well, I know what to do. And that's what I'm talking about. Don't just don't take him down and then go, oh, he's on the ground. I'm going to jump down there with him. That's Absolutely. my point. Yeah. Okay. That's where, and you can have, see, that's what I'm saying. You can have fluidity there. You can have a, oh, he threw him on the ground and then he, and then he jumped down there with him. That's that move fluidly. You move through it fluidly, but it had zero point from, from the takedown to the point where you re, re, uh, um, uh, made contact again with him, reconnected with him. Okay. You disconnect when you, uh, and that would be the thing that I would say would look at with it. When you're doing that, you need to maintain a connection. If you disconnect in between, then leave. That's not, uh, that's not the time to go back in and reconnect. This yeah. is one of the things I talk about with my students when you have joint locks and manipulations, for example, returning the storm. Then I know we're trying to wrap up returning the storm. One of the things that people do is they disconnect. They come through here and they, and they, they swing them around and then they disconnect and then they re-engage, okay? Right. If you throw somebody down and they're down and you've disconnected and you're disengaged, stay disengaged, leave. Don't re-engage so you can do some jiu-jitsu now. Yeah. What's the old saying? If, if you're, got, you're heading for the, uh, the iceberg and you can get off the boat, get off the boat. Get off the boat, yeah. It's just, it, it, you know, so you don't go down with the boat. Well, if the plane is... If the plane is on fire and you got a chance to grab the uh, air, the parachute, put it on and leave. <laughs> yeah, but, but you also you also don't get off the boat and then see that it's and then get back on the boat so that it can crash into the iceberg. That's it's my like, point. It's like, I mean, come on, this is what we call in Ed Parker's system common sense. Okay, right. for some reason we as martial arts have a this trait to uh, eliminate common sense in our mind. You know, I, hey, well, that's yeah, that's a human trait. That's a human it, flaw. Yeah, but it, we, I think I'm a badass. If I know this, I don't have to worry. Well, well, you know. I think that that I think that that stems from the the need for an ego to be full or fulfilled. Yeah. Well, yeah, we see that. I, I think I think there's two quotes I'm going to end with right now. Okay, one is Ed Parker's and one is mine. Ed Parker's the last thing he said in this fifth volume and i know he had many more he says at the first he said i am while i'm sad to see the series come to an end i am nevertheless encouraged by the knowledge that a number of other books which i have written will soon be ready for publication so he had vision mm -hmm. his last sentence he said here though following the systematic base has resulted in Kemple being propelling viable and void of stagnation Following the consistent format has taught me to view motion and its variety of methods of employment realistically. I know you like to say Kempo motion. You like to use that one, motion Kempo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and no, I don't. Oh, well, yeah, that, as, a, as a negative. But you use it. it, it, it. My, my feeling is this, is that Ed Parker taught us a very valuable lesson, and I think that you embrace that, Todd. And I think most of <laughs> The people that are members of the Hall of Fame, which is I call the gold standard, uh, and that's why we celebrate that greatness, is because they're driven to a greater purpose. And I was taught by a little girl that the greatest gift one can have is to be one to inspire others to personal greatness. Absolutely. So thank you, Mr. Durgan, Master Durgan, so much for what you shared with me tonight. It's been great to see you. We've, re, uh, we've restarted the Zoom. Meetings. Cool. This is going to be a continuous process. If there's questions, folks, uh, please write into us. Let me know if there's subjects you'd like, and I will make sure that we address that. Um, again, I always try to draw from the Hall of Fame members and their input, and it's probably the greatest, greatest lessons you can learn from these people. 
and hopefully they'll inspire you to your own personal greatness. With no further ado, Master Todd Durgan, thank you so very much. God bless you. Thank and you. I really appreciate it. My name is Paul Casey, Campo Karate Hall of Fame. You have a great night, and thank you so much for listening to us. <laughs>